Hey everyone, welcome to part two of the Singularity Computers NAS build log. In this video, I'm going to cover the completion of the build, the first boot, and some of the configuration. In this video, I mostly cover custom wiring because that is where most of the time went into this build. And there is so much to be learned about custom wiring, so I've decided to cover it whenever I get the chance in as much detail as possible. I'm now going to start right back from where I left off in the last video. Now I certainly don't like this exposed multicolored wire here, so I'm not just going to sleeve back to here, which is what you'd usually do. I'm going to sleeve all the way back to the center. And with these fans you can't get right into here like you can with some of the others. This is the closest you can get, so it means I don't need to remove the sticker, which is good. I've crimped on the pins and I'm starting to sleeve the first fan cable here. And something you always need to watch out for when doing this mod, sleeving all the way back to the center, is, is it actually going to fit in the fan frame at all? You know, sometimes they have a really narrow path and they have these clips holding the cable in position. And sometimes there's not enough space in this slot here. You may need to actually modify the frame. You may need to get a file and widen this up here. You may need to cable tie the cable in position. And sometimes the frame requires some substantial modifications to make this work, but this one is going to work quite well. I may have to widen that up, we'll wait and see. I've completed the custom cables for the three fans and I've reinstalled them and it's worked out very clean. The fan at the back here, cable disappears under the bottom of the motherboard there. This one just comes straight around, plugs in. Same with this one. So I'm happy with the way that has turned out. Now I just need to manage these cables here. Actually I could use a cable comb for this or something similar. There might be too many wire strands to be able to use a comb, but no, it's perfect. It's because it's only 22 gauge wire. Some of it I believe is 26 gauge. So, one about there. I mean, it's going to be hidden, but since when does that stop me? So, try to get it out of the way of the fans there. Although when it's this clean, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to get tangled in the fans and it's going to not be in the way of airflow really. So when you train cables, you don't need to tie them up anywhere near as much. So there's now just a few cables that I need to run from the power supply, the 24 pin, a 4 pin ATX down here, SATA power, obviously for the hot swap base, and also this Molex here, which I'm not sure if I have to connect that, but I probably do, that's something I still need to look into, but what I'm going to do with the 4 pin ATX, it comes as an 8 pin EPS split cable, and I only need four, so I'm going to remove the other wires, split it all the way down. I'm now removing the four wires that I don't need from this 8-pin EPS cable, and I'm using my MDPCX pin remover. Now this is made from stainless steel, so it's very durable, it's sprung. It needs to be on the outside of the pin, but on the inside of the connector. If the pins are in straight, it's pretty easy, but a lot of the time they're not. They're twisted or crooked, so it just makes it a little bit more difficult. Now, before you push it in all the way, push the pin in as far as it goes. 
put some decent pressure on it. Then as you're still pushing the pin in, push the MDPC pin remover in and then pull it out. The 8 pin EPS is now a 4 pin ATX. So when I come back to upgrade this system, install the M.2 and whatever else I'll be doing to it, I'm going to sleeve these cables. See, when they're not sleeved, they don't hold their position as well a lot of the time. So once they're sleeved, they get a bit stiffer and you can, you know, train them to sit where you want them to sit. On the back of the hot swap bays, they're powered by only two Molex. So we don't need to run any other power in the build, no SATA power, no other Molex power. So I can just run two Molex directly from one of the peripheral connections on the power supply. So that is where these 90 degree connectors are awesome. Particularly with SATA power where you have a whole lot of them lined up in a row. You know, imagine if each of these bays had one SATA power connector. Well, you can go all the way down with 90 degree SATA power connections and do it all on the one. Although, there's obviously a limit to how many you can do. I think the most I've done is eight, and I didn't have any problems, but that is something you'd have to look into depending on your power supply. But we're just going to do the two here, and this is only the, the only power we need to run in this build, so. Now normally the way I'd do this is with my needle nose pliers, just carefully using the round edge, pushing it in. But I'm only going to do it enough just to make a mark because I don't want to put too much pressure on these PCBs because it does require a lot of pressure to push the wires down into these 90 degree connections. Okay, now that I have that distance, I'm going to put the drive bays in. Now I just need to find that distance from the connector on the power supply to the 90 degree Molex connectors. Which you obviously need to do by physically running the wire where it's going to be routed. And I'm going to go up instead of down. And then I just kink it where it needs to be cut. Cut it and cut four of them. So this is just 18 gauge wire. I don't need to use 16 for this. I need to make sure that I have the connectors the right way to suit what I'm actually connecting up to. And I have my marks here on the wire from when I marked it before. So that one goes there. And just allow a tiny bit extra, a couple of millimeters extra is good. So I'm just using the rounded side of the needle nose pliers to push the wire in slowly. You don't need, if you use something sharp, you're going to cut through the wire. You definitely don't want to do that. So I'll push the four wires into the backs of both of these 90 degree Molex connectors and it's now time to install the covers onto the backs of them. Now there are two different types of covers and I have them clearly listed on the Singularity Computers store as a through cap, which is this one, which allows the wires to travel through the connector. So this is what you install on a connector like this. And then the other one is an end cap, which you can see has a longer side. Just one side is longer, which covers up the ends of the wires on a connector like this, which is at the end of the cable. So they just clip straight on. So. This Molex cable is going to go directly into the power supply and a lot of power supplies use 6-pin PCIe connectors for their peripheral connections and this power supply does. You know, generally Silverstone and Corsair use them. So that's what is going on the power supply end of this Molex power cable. But there's one more thing that we need to consider here and that is the pinout. And you can find a lot of the pinouts listed online 
because obviously you can't just plug these in wherever you want to. There is a specific pinout for them, and if you don't get it right, you're going to destroy your components. But you can just use the stock cables to figure out the pinout. If you take a look at the direction that the Molex connector is facing, you trace each individual wire to where it ends up in the 6-pin PCIe connector, and you copy this pattern onto the cables that you make. Okay, that cable's finished. I'm not sleeving it until I come back and do the upgrades to this system soon. So that is it, it's ready to install. And this is the final power cable that we need in this build. After this, we only need to connect the SATA data and this system is ready to boot. I'm just going to recheck that this pinout is correct one more time. I'm now onto the final step. I just checked the manual and found out that the memory has to be installed in the further slot away from the CPU when only one DIMM slot is populated, which is kind of weird. You'd think it'd be the closest one to the CPU, but often these are the way these things work out. And you can't make assumptions because the system often won't boot unless the correct memory slots are populated. Now, the SATA data cables, SATA data for the Americans, the ones that I have are not the ones I would like to use. I just don't have the correct lengths in stock, so this is something else I will definitely change. You know, I'll sleeve the SATA data cables and get some that are the right length that look a lot better because these just are terrible. The system is complete, at least for now, and ready to boot for the first time. Before I hit the power button, just a couple of things. Now this fan I had as an intake, it is definitely supposed to be an exhaust. So as you can see, I've turned it around. So we have one 120 millimeter fan as an exhaust here, an 80 millimeter fan as an exhaust on the power supply, which actually won't run most of the time, and two 120 millimeter fans as intakes on the side here, drawing in cold air for the hot swap bays for the hard drives. That's the way this case is designed. Now, FreeNAS is designed to be installed onto a flash drive, a USB key, you know, a dedicated flash drive. And that is the way that I'm going to set it up when I do the upgrades for this system, which will be quite soon, because I really want to just get this system finished and configured and set up exactly how I want it. But for now, I've just installed it onto a Western Digital Black 1 terabyte, and there's no harm done in installing it that way. You know, it can certainly run that way. It will just take up the entire space of the one terabyte hard drive because there's no partitioning with FreeNAS. I found out that one of the four terabyte Western Digital Reds was faulty. So now I only have the one terabyte black and the four terabyte red. I definitely need to get more hard drives. But let's hit the power button for the first time. Wow, it's extremely quiet. Probably one of the quietest fans I've ever used, actually. I can't even hear the fans. You can hear the hard drives. They're quite loud. That's where all of the sound is coming from. I can't hear the fans at all. So that is certainly very impressive. All right, I need to get into the boot menu here to boot from the flash drive. Okay, so we've reached the this menu. So we can now install Greenus. Select hard drive. Okay, I'm going to leave it there for now. There is still a lot I want to do to this system to complete it. And I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to use it until I've done those things because bare minimum, I need more hard drive space. I also need to have an electrician over here to install a port in this room for the internet. Right now I'm running cables to the other room and using wireless. So I really need to finish off my hardware configuration. Once I've done that, I'll take you through more of the process of installing and configuring FreeNAS. But I will say that I set up FreeNAS as a bootable ISO on a flash drive to install it using Rufus, which is a great program. I'll put a link in the video description to Rufus. And also there's a lot of great information on FreeNAS, how to install it and set it up. So I'll put some links in the video description so that you can check out all of that as well. But overall, I'm really happy with this build. I just want to, you know, order the last of the components and finish it off so that I can start properly using it. But anyway, 
That sums up this build log. There'll be a separate video for the upgrades. Thanks for watching, and remember that none of this would be possible without our patrons.